Thank you, Dr. Laney, for agreeing to be interviewed for our Living History Project. Uh, I'm sure that you feel good to know that you're a piece of living history. Um, well, I'm, <laughs> I'm glad I'm living. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a pleasure to uh, be sitting here with you and, and talking. Uh, just to set the context a little bit for your career at mm -hmm. Emory, uh, you were an undergraduate at Yale University where you majored in economics and then served in the military in Korea. And during that time in Korea, you experienced a kind of change of direction and mm -hmm. felt called to return to Yale for training in the ministry at Yale Divinity School. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a result of that that you went on to serve as pastor in the Methodist Church and eventually as a missionary and educator in Korea. And then you returned to Yale again where you completed, completed a PhD degree in Christian ethics in the uh, record time of two years uh, from start to finish. Uh, 21 months. <laughs> <laughs> what, 21 months, <laughs> even better. I think the Guinness Book of Records uh, has that. Uh, but then you were off to Vanderbilt uh, mm -hmm. as a faculty member in a fairly prestigious divinity school where you might have chosen to live mm -hmm. closer to home and pursued a career as scholar, teacher, and minister. And so, uh, I'm wondering why after three years, or what, what it was about Emory and the Candler School of Theology uh, that attracted you to accept the deanship at Candler in 1969 after only three years as an assistant professor at Vanderbilt. Well, uh, of course at Vanderbilt I had a good uh, view of theological education uh, as it was practiced in a a very good school and I both learned a lot there not only from my teaching but also in watching the administration and how they dealt with uh, curriculum and the really the formation of students for the pastorate and I began to get ideas of my own that were not always uh, the same as those that were being entertained at Vanderbilt as a result, when uh, the inquiry came in my middle of my third year there from Emory as to whether or not I might be interested in being considered for the deanship, I was fascinated, but not by any means sold on it because I knew so little about Emory at that time. That, I, being a Methodist even, mm -hmm. I knew that it was a Methodist university and I knew that it had a theology school, but I really wasn't familiar with it firsthand. And for that matter, I had never been to Atlanta. <laughs> so so <clears throat> one of the things that fascinated me when I arrived in Atlanta at the airport, even then, I thought, you know, this is a, this is a real city. <laughs> and I was comparing it with Memphis and Birmingham and the mm -hmm. other southern cities. I thought, this is outpacing those. And it certainly had a lot more vitality and energy than, than Nashville. And then I came out to the campus and was impressed, and Emory as it is now, is still being discovered. Mm -hmm. And uh, I realized, you know, this is, this is, this is for real. And uh, I thought, you know, this could provide an opportunity to try out a lot of the ideas that I developed in, at Vanderbilt and really were part of my own sense of emerging call and vocation, particularly with regard to education. Mm -hmm. And... Um, when, when things really became serious, uh, I also discovered that, that uh, there was great potential here. I mean, real opportunity. I mean, the combination of a vibrant southern city that sort of was leading in race relations, which were very important to me, and a university which had huge potential, particularly in the divinity school, the theology school. So when the offer came, I accepted it. Uh, gladly, because it was, first of all, it was taking me back into the church 
Vanderbilt was not connected formally anymore to this church. And I thought, you know, I also would, might have an opportunity to shape theological education in a way or influence it that would affect for good the church, would have a positive beneficial influence on the church itself, on the pastorate. And so it was the formation of pastors and the, the uh, successive influence on the church that, that, and the opportunity that all provided that brought me here. Mm -hmm. And I've never looked back. When you uh, got to Candler then in 1969, mm -hmm. uh, you must have had clearly some, some goals, some intentions. Uh, what, what specifically did you have in mind in terms of shaping theological education through Candler? Mm -hmm. and, and how did you set about trying to reach mm -hmm. those goals yeah. or move the faculty toward them? Well, uh, first of all, I, I was very deeply committed to contextual education uh, in a sense uh, a modern counterpart would be service learning. Mm -hmm. The the sense in which uh, you are put into a situation, it was vicariously at Harvard and other law schools and business school with a case study. But in this instance, you really enter the situation itself with all of the emotional and, and uh, other overtones, uh, but under su careful supervision, not only of the person who is an expert in it, uh, in one case, a uh, clinical pastoral education, a hospital or uh, an institution similar to that, or an urban setting. I was, in, I was very much interested in getting the pastoral uh, students into more than just the hospitals. I wanted them to understand the urban problems, the race problem, the problem of poverty and health care and that sort of thing. And so we set up a, a series of um, practicums, you might say, in which uh, all the students uh, who were in the uh, pastoral program, the ministerial program, had to take uh, 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 one full semester, or its equivalent, in one the CPE where they learned to be in supervision, and then the next year in an urban setting. And then finally we did it in uh, terms of the church itself, uh, identifying churches that we thought uh, modeled good ministry and care for the parishioners and the role in the community. But the unique thing about it, that was doing it that intensively was probably somewhat of a pioneering effort mm -hmm. at that time, although now I think it's pretty commonplace. The thing that was really unique uh, was insisting that the faculty themselves participate in this, uh, move out of the classroom. Uh, this, this had some very interesting <laughs> reverberations. Uh, <clears throat> and I was uh, enormously helped in this by uh, Charles Gherkin, whom I recruited from Grady Hospital. I was very impressed with him and uh, brought him out as a uh, a uh, member of the faculty teaching, but also who would oversee the, the whole program and meet once a month with the faculty who were participating. What, what this meant was if there were 12 supervisors who were professionals, there were 12 faculty paired with those, each of those who each had 15 students or whatever. And uh, the faculty were expected to reflect theologically in behalf of the students, as it turned out, in behalf of themselves. And Gherkin was a master at helping shape the faculty and overcome their resistance, which we would all have. I mean, this is not a criticism, it's just natural. So that out of that, we not only uh, got more closely allied with the students and their struggles, but also the faculty themselves were beginning to forge a community because they were sharing, all of them were sharing something in common. Mm -hmm. Now that, that was a, a rotating thing. They didn't have to do that all the time, but they had to do it on a regular basis. And it continued to have some resistance because of the pressures of, you know, the academic pressures. But I think that was the most important thing that we did uh, because it had an impact on the student body 
Uh, it, it also created a community with the faculty and a bond with the students. And I participated myself, so I know what it was like. And it meant a great deal to me. Uh, <clears throat> there were several other aspects to the uh, opportunities that Candler provided. One was, at that time, the Ministerial Education Fund of the Methodist Church, which had actually begun out of the old 1% and 2% plan that Henry Bowden and uh, Buster Bird and uh, D.W. Brooks had started back in the 50s with Dean Trimble, um, had now gone nationwide, was beginning to, to uh, move into high gear, and that was providing significant funding for the Methodist seminaries. And Candler was um, getting about um, almost a million dollars a year, which was a lot of money at that time. So I persuaded President Atwood to let Candler be a tub on its own bottom. Uh, I, I just thought we could do it. And this was a relief to him because Candler had been uh, subsidized by a substantial amount every year by the general university funds. So we were able not only to, that gave a, a lot of freedom in terms of how much uh, new faculty we could add as long as we could pay for it. Mm -hmm. And we could carry over our, uh, our uh, balances at the end of the year, which had not been done before, where they never had a balance. So we could build up a reserve, in other words. So within the first three or four years, we added 12 net faculty mm. to, a, to a faculty that, at the, the, that was almost a 50% increase. And these were all bright young faculty. It was a huge change, and theological education is a small universe, and that caused a lot of waves around the country that Candler was doing all this, you know. And so that was me. And then the third thing was that came a little later was the opportunity to purchase the Hartford Seminary Library, which catapulted us from nowhere to number two in the country and among theological libraries. And really was a marvelous addition, not just in terms of numbers, but in terms of quality and range and that sort of thing. So all of that began, was a sort of a yeasty mix that uh, kept everything bubbling, but in a great spirit. And of course, I, I would have to say that uh, having brought Jim, persuaded Jim Waits to come with me from Nashville out of the pastorate, uh, and uh, he was at that time very, relative, very young, uh, <clears throat> And we just saw eye to eye. We, we had a, a, a team that was, ran so easily, you know, just one friction and that sort of thing. We had all these young faculty who had all their energy. And you could use that. This was, this was a new infusion, not only of intellectual capability, but of just plain physical energy. Mm -hmm. And so the excitement was palpable. And it, it was a great story. You know, we really were doing, I remember, um, about the fourth year I was there, uh, somebody said, there's a new ranking out among the theological schools, and, and Candler was ranked way, you know, Candler had never been ranked anywhere, and he was ranked way up, I don't know, tied with Princeton or something, and, you know, up in the top pantheon of the top half dozen or something, and all of a sudden, you know, <laughs> there was a new, it was a bracing realization. Well, there's a real cultural change that suggests that what all you're of that. talking about. And of course, uh, concurrent with that, all of a sudden, uh, Candler was being regarded in a new way in, within the university. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, this is a school that was really moving. And I have to say, it was because we had these new funds, and that enabled us to get the new people, and then uh, we were able to obtain the library and all that. And there was just a, a wonderful mix, and just great, great spirit. You know, I. I look back upon those eight years as being uh, as productive and as happy as any I've ever had. One of the things that <clears throat> strikes me about the theology school now as compared to what I imagine it was in those days, particularly in the late 60s, is that uh, theological education has many more women than it did now. Mm. Uh, there are probably well, 1969 was only seven years after uh, the university had won the right to admit African-American students without mm -hmm. tax penalties. Uh, women were still fairly new at Emory, let mm -hmm. alone at the theology mm -hmm. school. What was the transition like? What was 
going on in the theology school in terms of the integration of the classrooms by both uh, African Americans mm -hmm. and women. Yeah. Well, we, we began, of course, uh, since there was gammon across town, uh, we, we, it was not like there was no theological education for Methodist uh, uh, African American ministers. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we began recruiting very, uh, very uh, um, aggressively, and gradually built up the numbers. Uh, in I think about 1971, I recruited uh, Grant Shockley uh, to Candler. He was the first full professor, African American full professor in the university. Uh, I, I think that's correct. Mm -hmm. And uh, he brought a wonderful spirit, that a pastoral spirit to the whole school. And so that eased the whole thing. The other thing that we did was in this contextual education, when we began having um, um, seminars in churches as part of our supervised ministry, we paired them with a number of African-American churches. And I myself taught <coughs> a, a course at uh, Cal, Houston's uh, Presbyterian Church mm -hmm. down um, near the uh, what's now Turner Field across the uh, interstate. And Cal, they had 12 lay people and we had 12 students from that church and Cal and I co-taught that, that course for a full semester. And those kinds of experiences were marvelous in moving us along and <clears throat> helping many of the uh, Southern white students to become at ease with the whole issue of uh, integration. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't mean to say it was seamless or effortless and that sort of thing, but it, it never, at least at Candler, didn't pose them. The bigger issue came because of the um, quick movement of the number of uh, women students. Uh, and we had to make a corresponding shift in our whole a self-understanding ethos because, you know, you, the vocabulary changes and, and so many things changed with that mm -hmm. as well. And uh, then we also had the uh, issue of my last several years of uh, the more conscious participation of the uh, gay community mm -hmm. and, uh, and their demand, uh, appropriate demand for recognition and participation in the community. That probably set up more uh, hostile uh, reaction than any of the than the other two, mm -hmm. and uh, I remember we had some real confrontations in a in an assembly, where you know I just sat and uh, dealt with the questions and all that many of the students who were very uneasy with this mm -hmm. uh, had raised, but you know I look back on that and th this, this there was a kind of residual. I don't know whether I call it goodwill, but there was a, a fund of um, of community that kept us from fracturing too badly. There was plenty of strains, but uh, we didn't, you know, fall into just factions and that sort of ag aggressively hostile groups at each other's throats. The theology school really had risen in stature uh, nationally in, in its uh, um, ranking, let's say, and uh, the graduate division of religion uh, began its right. climb upward. In many ways, the, uh, the pockets of religious study throughout the university were academically at the fore. Um, and yet, 1976, Sanford Atwood announces that the following year he's going to retire as president. And uh, you come to the fore as the candidate for the presidency. I imagine that there were some skeptics around the university. Oh, uh, no, no, uh, no skeptics. <laughs> about uh, the, the prospect of, of having this uh, research university led by a Methodist minister, the dean of the theology school. Uh, what, what was, uh, let me ask you first of all, what? It, what it was that led you to consider moving from the deanship of the theology school to leadership of the university, mm -hmm. and then how did how did you address the skeptics out there? Well, I don't know how I addressed the skeptics uh, except by action, but um, 
part of it was the growing confidence that what we were doing was was an appropriate uh, sort of setting the pace f for the university. I mean, obviously, disciplines vary, and the schools have uh, the curriculum and all that, but the ideas of what made for uh, uh, outstanding educational experience, I think, were valid in themselves. I had brought Lee Keck here from Vanderbilt in 72, I think, to uh, head up the graduate division. He went on seven years later to become dean at Yale. And uh, then in 1974, uh, Krista Stendhal, who was dean at Harvard, invited me to come up as, as a visiting professor. I had a leave coming, which had already been approved by the president and uh, so forth. So. We went up there, and it turned out very quickly that what they were doing was looking me over for the possibility of his successor. And I taught uh, a seminar uh, there and, um, you know, realized uh, that I was interviewed by trustees and, of course, got to know Derek Bach. And I realized, you know, that what we were doing at Emory was, was, of, that, was of that measure. I mean, I didn't, we didn't have anything to apologize for. I mean, Emory was very good. And um, it, there was a kind of a new confidence built on the fact that I had already served while I was dean on the uh, visiting committee to uh, uh, oversee the uh, Yale Religious Life and Divinity School. I served on the committee. I wasn't chair of it. And <clears throat> was confident that you know, what we were doing was was, you know, it was good. It didn't, didn't no apology to anybody, and it didn't take second place to either Harvard or Yale. Well, with that kind of confidence, and the fact that because uh, Henry Bowden and some of the other trustees knew that Harvard was looking at me, they already, when I came back in 75, began saying, well, you know, we'd like for you to consider the possibility of being president. Now, there was a lot to go through and all, and very, the integrity of the process, but they, they, want, they wanted me not to leave, in other words. And I was comfortable with that because I felt that uh, if it should work out that way, and I knew a number of the trustees, uh, that, you know, we would have a, uh, a team. We'd have the trust, at least a handful of the trustees backing it. And uh, <clears throat> I had the confidence then that what we were doing could be drawn on a larger canvas. Uh, I don't mean everything, but the general idea is the direction of the university. And uh, so I think uh, out of that, and the kind of entrepreneurship that was uh, involved with the Hartford Seminary purchase, which, by the way, got a whole page in the New York Times on the second section or something back then, which they said was the largest transfer of books in American history, which I, we loved all that, you know. And um, so out of that uh, grew the, the thought that, that if, it, if the uh, bid should come to me, I certainly would not be uh, uh, averse to taking it, you know. I re you know, it wasn't something that I had consciously sought uh, that I can say that, but <clears throat> as it kind of evolved, the like as the likelihood of it increased or the prospects, my confidence that it would not be inappropriate all, seemed to correspondingly increase. Mm -hmm. I think that's the only way I'd say it. Uh, you know, I didn't. I didn't feel at all intimidated by the thought of working in the whole university as opposed to just a theology school. You mentioned the Hartford uh, book collection purchase, which certainly was a bold move. Mm. And I, I think of the beginning of your presidency really as a, as a series of bold steps. It, it may not have felt like that at the time, but just shortly after you became president, you uh, and the board agreed to launch a major fundraising drive. I think when you became president, you announced that some of your ambitions included raising the level of scholarship funding, uh, endowed mm -hmm. professorships, right, and, right. and so on. And clearly, you also had a vision for uh, enhancing campus life and student mm -hmm. uh, life. 
But it was really in 1979, the announcement of the $105 million Woodruff Fund transfer to Emory that uh, came as a, uh, a blockbuster piece of news and was, was really a bold, mm -hmm. bold uh, step for the university. Garnered national attention as the largest gift to higher education in American history up to that point. Say a little bit about what led to that gift and how that was nurtured and, mm -hmm. and what some of the thinking was mm -hmm. behind it, both in terms of the university administration and the trustees of the fund. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think to answer that, I'd want to say, first of all, that uh, within three months of my assuming office as president, I did lay before the trustees a whole list of things that I wanted to try to accomplish. And I, I look back on it, and I, you know, I, I want to be careful. This is not uh, said in a patronizing way, but I really saw myself as an educator in every sense of that word. My role was to articulate and educate the trustees, that is, you know, to help them understand what, what we were about and if, they were, if the goals were worthy to get their support educate the faculty as to what we were trying to accomplish together in addition to their own uh, work and all, and of course to educate the students that was, and how did we do that most uh, successfully. And so constant, it was always on my mind to try to articulate, to try to uh, set forth constantly what we're about and why, and why it's important and how we might get there. And of course, to get there, it means enlisting support. So in that sense, it was an, a, an act of persuasion. Nothing but rhetoric. I learned this way back. <laughs> the rhetoric of, of, of touching the common chords of response that people shared and then building on that, you know. So in a way, you develop confidence and, and trust and you move forward. Um, I think the trustees were a little, a little they, they sort of caught their breath when I laid out what I thought we needed to do and began to look put a price tag on it because it was really very aggressive for Emory at that time and you know there always there's a question of well do you really need this I mean are these ambitions or you know are these real or are these just uh, personal uh, sort of things you know and you know you, you you have to they have to buy into the vision that this is not only what should be done, but it can be done. And that if in doing it, we really will accomplish something that's worthwhile. You know, we're not just going to keep along with the status quo and that sort of thing. So I uh, set that forth. Now, the interesting thing is that <clears throat> Mr. Woodruff wasn't on the board, so I had to go over and see him a lot to keep him up, and, up to date with what was going on back here. And in those meetings, uh, I wanted to share with him what we were about. And uh, we had some interesting talks, and particularly the time when he uh, said he didn't, didn't believe in endowment. <laughs> we were trying to raise a lot of money for endowment. Well, it turns out that was based on his uh, thought that endowment was idle capital. And it took me about two or three weeks to figure out idle capital. Well, the opposite of idle capital is working capital. Ah, that is a term that they use in business is working capital. So we, we simply transliterated endowment into working capital and he bought it. So that, that was fine. But uh, once he signed on, it wasn't a question of what he was doing, but he had to begin to, to get a sense of the enthusiasm and himself participate in this, in the positive spirit that it was. And so that, that was, uh, took a while. And of course, it was two years and something after I became president before we got the gift. The gift itself, um, of course, grew out of the issue of what Mr. Woodruff would do the, all along. The, the question was, this will be a successful campaign if Mr. Woodruff gets behind it. And initially, uh, as you may know, the, uh, the Emily and Ernest Woodruff Fund which had been an endowment set up by Robert and George Woodruff's parents, had been a foundation and had been turned into a fund to avoid certain problems for the RS, namely the payout of 5%. As a fund, it only, it only needed to pay out the income, which is a, was different. 
And uh, <clears throat> the fund's income was set in order to meet IRS requirements, set it at the, the uh, institutions that would receive it. And Emory was set to receive no less than 40 percent. It could receive more, but no less of the income. And then a whole bunch of other institutions received the other 60 percent. And, and the trustees of it were the ones that made the decision as to how the distribution would be. And I remember uh, one of the things that uh, Jimmy Sibley and I talked about er very early on, and Jimmy Williams was, maybe we can get the uh, trustees of the fund to raise the payout to Emory from 40 to 60 percent, which would be a big, in, you know, lot. If the fund was worth over $100 million, that'd be equivalent of $20 million, the income from $20 million. But in the process, the thought of that uh, and the thought that uh, George Woodruff, that he and Robert were going to die, you know, in the not too distant future, led them, particularly George, to say, why don't we just turn the whole thing over to Emory? I mean, the corpus. Mm -hmm. Well, the difference between receiving a portion of the income and getting the whole corpus is enormous because, of course, the growth of the corpus over the next, uh, what, 15 years was just unbelievable. I mean, the hunt, those three million shares of Coke that were transferred to us, uh, the market value today would be way over two billion dollars. I mean, if you want to say, why, what would a gift comparable to that uh, make a splash today? Well, two billion dollars would do it. But that was big money. Yeah. And uh, anyway, George took appropriate pride in George Woodruff in. Uh, sort of helping it. Mr. Woodruff, of course, had to be enthusiastic about it, he, although it wouldn't have happened without his say-so, because he was the dominant brother. But um, I remember, um, and I want this for the record, in addition to Jimmy Sibley and Jimmy Williams, in addition to um, those that I've named who were played a just an absolutely key role in seeing that this happened was uh, Garland Herndon, who at that time was um, Vice President for Health Affairs at Emory. Garland was Mr. Woodruff's personal physician and had become very close to him as a confidant. And Garland and I often worked and talked with Mr. Woodruff and the kind of intimacy that that allowed in terms of helping establish the confidence was it was really very important. The second thing was, up until the time of that gift, all of the uh, monies that had come from Mr. Woodruff had gone into medicine or medically related fields. They finally got it uh, enough to build the chemistry building one time on the basis that it was pre-med. <laughs> But the, Woodruff, the Robert Woodruff Library was built with government money and other funds. It was not built out of Woodruff funds. In any case, um, <clears throat> the gift came without restriction. That is, on its use and how, it, although they said it, sh we'd like for it to be endowment, they didn't even, I, I don't think there was any restriction on that. It was, um, and it was for the university. And that was a godsend because then, without you know, uh, we could begin to make plans for the whole university, mm -hmm. not not sliding medicine, but putting it in perspective, you know, in the total picture. The other thing that uh, happened about that time was the, uh, the the growing conviction that we ought to try to sequester the Woodruff Fund from the general endowment. The general endowment, when we received it, was, I think, about $175 million. So um, that fund alone was a 40% increase of our endowment and took us above Duke and Vanderbilt. Of course, the whole campaign raised, I think, 200 something million. So we, we really increased the endowment considerably more, as well as raising money for projects and that sort of thing. But the idea of sequestering the thing was that uh, we wanted to see if we couldn't continue the, the power of initiative 
within the university. Once it gets built into the budget and income stream, it, its power is there, but it has no, uh, no uh, uh, an additional impetus into the budget or into the programs. <clears throat> and uh, we succeeded in, in persuading the trustees. I don't, it wasn't hard to persuade them because they always like to be conservative. But it was a hard role for the faculty. And some of the faculty were extraordinarily critical of the first few years of our use of the fund because they didn't see the immediate results. In fact, uh, some rode in the wheel that they thought that I somehow was, uh, had some sort of chicanery involved, in this sort of, which is incredible. But in any case, uh, it, the first working out of this, since we had set up scholarships and wooded professorships and special project like that as being the first call on it, was the um, need for a huge infusion in the Emory College and, and scholarships. You know, we just, it's hard to believe what the scholarship budget was when I took over. I think it was less than a million dollars for the whole college. We were just so heavily tuition dependent, you know, and that constrains us enormously. And uh, David Mender, who was then the dean, came and he said, we need $20 million. <laughs> $20 million, oh no. I don't remember what we finally wound up with, but it was a substantial amount. But we agreed that we would start off the first year with that amount, and the next year we would, re well, it would grow, and then we'd back out. It would grow year by year. We, you know, would come in with the freshmen and so forth. But then after four years, we began to back it out, and we did. Mm -hmm. And the uh, college put it, had built, gradually built it into their budget. Well, the point of all this was to try to leave at least 50% uh, of the Woodruff Fund free and unencumbered so that we could do matching things and pull back and so forth. And I think that worked for a long time. I know that I think probably by now it's long since uh, been, been fed into the budget, but. That enabled for at least um, 15 years to start initiatives that were just invaluable. I mean, we could just simply do things, you know. I mean, not just build buildings, but more importantly, programmatically. And often it enabled us to match things, get, get funds from foundations and other foundations around the country to, to uh, carry out these initiatives. Mm -hmm. You, uh, early on, after receiving the uh, Woodruff gift, appointed a what amounts to a blue ribbon committee yeah. uh, chaired by our mm -hmm. alumnus, distinguished Emory alumnus, Howard Lamar, uh, mm -hmm. who was then, I think, dean at uh, Yale. Dean of Yale College, Yale yeah. College. Mm -hmm. um, later, what, later for one year president. Uh, that's yeah. right. Yeah. That's right. I'm just wondering uh, to what extent the uh, process of that committee's work and the, and the recommendations of that committee mm. helped to guide the use of the fund. Well, it was invaluable uh, in many ways, both for the substance of their uh, recommendations. Uh, things like scholarship and professorships are generic. Which professorships? Which programs to back up? In other words, some professorships require, you know, support. Uh, particularly for research, and which library work for you. You know, all of that is tied in. That committee was invaluable in establishing those priorities and making recommendations. And um, <clears throat> did the faculty buy into the uh, that committee's work? Well, they way? did. Uh, the, partly because that committee said, "You have a unique opportunity here with this um, this infusion." Now, if you use it wisely, you can really move Emory ahead. Mm -hmm. And I think most faculty, believe, partly because of the, of the sheer distinction of that group, all of them came from very distinguished universities and in their fields mm -hmm. were stellar. Mm -hmm. And consequently, they carried an authority that was very much needed, both for our internally here and with our trustees. Mm -hmm. And they met a number of times across the campus with re respective groups and faculty and all. They did a marvelous job, and their report was very seriously weighed. And 
implemented to the point where when Howard Lamar came down and met with our trustees, I think at Sea Island or someplace um, in the late 80s, he, he was very uh, uh, laudatory in how well we had actually been, how faithful we had been to the recommendations in getting them done. I want to come back to something you said earlier about uh, the power of persuasion and the art of rhetoric and the importance mm -hmm. of rhetoric and language mm -hmm. to the presidency of mm -hmm. uh, the university or to any leadership position. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the phrases that people appropriately associate with your presidency mm -hmm. is the phrase, the education of the heart. This was the title of an address you gave at Harvard and it was later the title of a collection of your speeches and essays. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious about how you arrived at that phrase, how you came to that, uh, not just that phrase, but to that concept as a kind of guiding emphasis mm -hmm. of your leadership. Well, really this was a, um, a formulation that kind of uh, uh, grew out of uh, this idea of education as formation. Uh, I. My own education at Yale, particularly in the Divinity School, and my uh, two-year stint as uh, chaplain and as uh, English teacher at Choate School, a boarding school in Connecticut, convinced me of of the age the age old business going back to Plato and of the importance of formation. Education is not merely theoretical; it's it's a total person and that values are inherent in what's going on and what's important, how we choose this and that, and what attracts us and what repels us. All of that's part of it, and it's simply a matter of explicating that and trying to... The desiccation of higher education because of the excessive specialization and the pressures on the faculty to be accountable to their disciplines nationally and their professional organizations rather than either to the, their own institution or their students. That, that tension that they live with. Now, this is not a criticism of the fact that that is life as we see it today. Uh, nevertheless, tended, unless there was a countervailing uh, force, then it would pull the faculty away and, and their, uh, they felt that their um, <clears throat> assessment in their work was primarily by their peers. And that's a very important part of the quality. But also an important thing is the, um, the dynamics of the classroom and the interaction of faculty and students. And I, over and over again I'm impressed when some of the finest faculty and the most distinguished scholars speak of how some of their best insights come from seminars with undergraduates because there's a free-flowing kind of interaction of, in that scholarship and so forth. Not just the pursuit of a laser-like thing, but, but that freshness and impromptu quality. Mm -hmm. And it was that uh, aspect uh, in formation and how people really you know, while we might back away from in loco parentis, the fact is that faculty have a huge influence on how stu what students think and how they feel, how their their view of life. I mean, they really want to size. They want to find the student. They don't want to be told, and they don't certainly don't want it imposed and make it a requirement. But they are constantly taking their cue from faculty and from mentors. That's the whole, whole point of what a mentor means. It's not just what you learn from them uh, uh, consciously, but all that, and then, and you know, and the issue of in, in law and in medicine and other thing of apprenticeship and, and internship and all that sort of thing, carries with it that kind of weight. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so it has to do with judgment as well as knowledge that comes out of this kind of education. and. I don't know where the phrase came from, Gary, but it, I think uh, it, in, it, it was an evolution, a series of speeches that I had developed talking to teachers, actually. Mm -hmm. And then um, Harvard asked me to speak to the uh, National Association of Alumni Heads. And uh, 
so I, I gave that speech, and the, the um, editor of the Harvard Magazine was there, and he said, that is so radical. <laughs> radical. Well, yeah, Plato's radical, and, <laughs> and, <laughs> and Rousseau is radical, and, you know, all of the great philosophers of education. Um, uh, you know, I think back of my own education, and, and this, this is where I got it. It's, it's, it's hardly novel. But it, it, in many ways it guided, I would imagine, your thinking about campus life programs. It was. Uh, certainly the uh, contextual education that you spoke about. Uh, in all of that. School. And my desire to get a better campus life experience for students was, was part and part. This wasn't just indulging the students. It was really an attempt to make more conscious and to give a more positive spin mm -hmm. to how they experienced and the extracurricular activity, all the things that go on on campus that are part of the education, you know. And it was that. And uh, anyway, the, the Harvard Magazine published, <laughs> published this speech and <laughs> to, it was supposed to shock and awe the, <laughs> the Harvard audience. The Harvard faculty, I think, read it and yawned. <laughs> but, Let them do that down in Emory. <laughs>
the gap between the reality of of a community of scholars and all the richness of connotation that implies and the um, fractionated light modern life of specialization where people have very little in common and um, the careerist orientation of the students uh, trying to overcome that so that they would be in a way receptive if you have a goal that is so clearly defined I had this problem in theology school. I know what I want to be. I want to be this kind of a preacher. Well, that's exactly what I wanted to get out of it. I mean, to help them. I, it's not that you wanted to destroy it. It's you wanted to set it aside and let them really develop and not have a foreclosed uh, kind of um, uh, maturation. And um, I think there was the gap, go back to the earlier point, between my ideal of a community where really there was a lot shared in common and we had cross-disciplinary conversations and the students were involved in things and the reality of modern world life. And I think that tension exists, every, you know, wherever. Uh, I think the importance is to maintain that tension. And the sad thing is on the campuses where the tension is lost and it just simply is given over to um, specialization and and the society's definition of what life should be I've always felt and I guess this comes out of my background as a minister but the prophetic aspect of the Old Testament that a university and a college should always be standing in critical uh, uh, stance toward culture not in not in rejection not necessarily in opposition but always in an appraising stance and so I have a lot of problems with much of modern life which wants simply an endorsement of the careerism and the success motif and the, um, the unlimited grab for money and that sort of thing. The extent to which um, um, finances become the end all of university life. It's funny that somebody who tried to get the Woodruff give would talk like that, but you know, I'm really, I, it, it's very sad to see a kind of an unquestioned evaluation of things in terms of, just in terms of money. I've, I've never known it to be so meretricious. And that's why I think this idea of formation and community of scholars and all that holds some ideals that are intentional with that is so important. Mm -hmm. I really believe that the university should embody in some sense the soul mm -hmm. of a nation. Mm -hmm and not just be its uh, cheerleader. Uh, you, now I'm beginning to, <laughs> to, <laughs> I'm beginning to indulge in the rhetoric you were talking about. But I can't help it. I really feel so passionately about this. And the point is, is the funny thing is, when you begin to really talk about it, not in um, accusatory or judgmental terms, but in terms of aspirational terms, a lot of people agree. Now, whether that's going to change their life is another matter or not, but uh, I think that this is, is very important for students to, to graduate with a thought that they might find fulfillment in something that is service and not just in terms of acquisition. Mm -hmm. One legacy that uh, you helped to create is the School of Public Health, where a lot of that sense oh, yeah. of right. service to right. the world is, resides very strongly right. in the right. spirit and, of the and the And the whole ethics center and the center for religion and, uh, and law, mm -hmm. all of these are an attempt, you know, the, the, the loose seminar, which was mm -hmm. an attempt to bring things together, not just so people could talk and sort of have a a coffee clatch business with the faculty, but so they could really be fructified mm -hmm. by other fresh ideas mm -hmm. and find out that there is a great big world out there and that it actually can have something to say to you, you know? Mm -hmm. This is, the, the, here we are in a university, not here, but in any university, with all of this wonderful collection of stuff. And so little of it is understood or appreciated by those that are outside the discipline. And you know, you just like to see a little of that movement going. You know, the Quadrangle Club at Chicago is a wonderful place where people from all of the university meet and 
and share uh, meals and drinks and and just talk across all kinds of disciplines. And uh, you know, I, I think that uh, this continues to hold a real uh, a pull toward me for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I I'm confident that Emory will be pursuing these things because they're universal. These are these are not not uh, these are not um, uh, sectarian or idiosyncratic. I hope. I thought I would uh, ask you for some impressions mm -hmm. of, uh, or memories of uh, some yeah. of the Emory leaders and benefactors and great lights <coughs> that you encountered during your time as president. Uh, Henry Bowden Sr., chairman well, of the Board of Trustees, when you became Henry, president. Henry was sui generis. He was uh, uniquely Emory, beloved by Emory and uh, uh, unqualified love for Emory. Uh, he and his generation of Emory graduates back in the 30s ran the university for a long time. He and Pollard Terman and Beaufley Jones and, uh, of course, uh, uh, Jake Ward and uh, a whole bunch of others were involved in that. Henry was really the one who recruited me for uh, president. Uh, I wouldn't be president. I wouldn't have been president if, if he hadn't been for Henry. Uh, he had, he believed in me, I think, and um, despite the fact that I was a Methodist minister and a theologian, <laughs> I, you know. And I want to say here that I can understand why faculty would have been very uneasy because, you know, they'd gone through the God is dead uh, controversy, and the church didn't come out too well on that from the standpoint of academic freedom. Although Emory stood tall, and that was Atwood's finest hour, and Henry Bowden backed him up. Uh, that established Emory as not a uh, a little church school, but a serious university with with church relations. Mm -hmm. uh, but in any case, um, Henry uh, just knew everybody and everything, and of course he was a great rock, raconteur, and that made it meant, it meant that you know he could always give a speech at the drop of a hat, and he was like the Pied Piper. And uh, I learned so much from Henry, uh, you know, how to deal with people in a gracious way and not simply a hectoring way, as, <laughs> as is a tendency of ministers, you know. Uh, and he was a dear Methodist, and I think as long as Henry was around and D.W. Brooks and others, uh, they saw to it that the church understood Emory, and they, they kept the church at bay from the standpoint of being intrusive because they were able to uh, assure the church that Emory was doing its job. I think when, when they passed from the scene, it, it left a vacuum that was hard to fill. And I was here when they were gone. So I remember the difficulties we began to have, including Glenn, mm -hmm. the difficulty of getting, uh, after all, here we've got, a, in a sense, a chapel on the school that we, that we had no control over who was preaching in it. And uh, that was a long-standing part of it. But anyway, Henry was um, such a uh, remarkable uh, person. Uh, you know, there, there are a lot of people like Henry who really have loved Emory in the long way. And in a way, I, I realized that uh, I was an outsider who came in. and. I had to learn to love, see Emory from their standpoint and not just the Emory that I thought it ought to have become. And the combination of those two is a powerful thing. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you about a, a faculty <clears throat> member that's uh, legendary, uh, now passed from the scene, George Cuthenow. George, I, I call him my beloved curmudgeon. <laughs> Uh, George and I got acquainted when uh, Bert and I and our children were at Oxford when I was dean at the, the theology school in Oxford, England. He was over there on leave, and we were there for a, a term. And we just got acquainted. We had saw each other a lot and became real good friends. I think up until that time, the last thing he would have ever wanted was the thought of a Methodist minister being president of Emory. But I think after that, we became friends, and it, it was not, 
if it was not something he endorsed, it was something that at least he could live with. <laughs> but uh, I, I, of course, he was the uh, what do you call it? The not the beetle, but the, the, the chief marshal. Chief marshal, right? And uh, he took great pride in that, and he helped me design my president's robe, and uh, we had a great time. Um, we we would often disagree. And it was a wonderful disagreement because we, we could really snarl at each other and never mean it. One of the uh, first Woodruff professors you recruited was Richard Ellman. Mm -hmm. Dick Ellman was a, a lovely human being and a marvelous scholar. Um, at that time was the Goldsmiths Professor of English Literature at Oxford. And uh, we were able to get him to spend half of a year here every year as Woodard Professor. Uh, Elman and his wife Mary were a marvelous addition, and they, I think they raised the uh, visibility of Emory across the Atlantic uh, by choosing to come here. And he was such a gracious soul that instead of being seen as an outsider and a sort of, um, you know, uh, snob or something coming in from fancy places. He quickly became a real colleague of the, of, not just of English, but of art, in arts and sciences. And I think did more to allay the anxieties or uneasiness or standoffishness of the faculty about these new appointments mm -hmm. uh, because he was so fine. Of course, he, he, he and I became really good friends and we visited him in Oxford and all. I might add as a as a footnote, they used to live at Clifton Towers when they stayed at, when they were at Emory, which is not far from Lowater. And at that time, our paper was delivered at, uh, on Clifton Road at the mailbox, which is a half a mile from the house. And I'd look out in the morning, and here would be Dick Elman, and what I called his fast trudge. <laughs> this was jogging, but it was hardly jogging. And he would drop the paper at our at our doorstep and what keep going story. around the circle. And I thought, whoever had a more sublime paper <laughs> <laughs> paper boy. That's a great story. <laughs> Pollard Terman, for whom the Terman yeah. Presidential Center is named. Right, Pollard. Pollard was one of those, along with Henry Bowden. Um, he was willing to do anything for Emory. And when we were without a development officer very early in my presidency, he became the acting vice president for development, which means his, meant his office at that time was down the hall. And he became a very dear and trusted advisor for me. Um, invaluable, he, because he was both a trustee and, and he had, you know, he really wanted to see things work out. And we had some some fairly rocky times. I might say that um, Henry Bowden came to me one day and he said, Jim, three members of arts and sciences, all of them full professors, have told me that you're the worst appointment was ever made and it was, the sooner we could get rid of you, the better. <laughs> he said, what do you think about that? I said, I don't think much of it myself. <laughs> he said, I told him, I said, just give him another year or so and you're going to change your mind. And uh, Pollard was one of the people who could interpret what we were trying to do to the trustees in a gracious way. Mm -hmm. You know, it was really important to have people on your side who, who, could, who could speak in your behalf about issues that might be either misunderstood or seem too ambitious or uh, little ants, you know, pe made people uneasy. And um, Pollard was just a marvelous person in that regard. And of course, he was very generous, both for the Tall Foundation and also with his own money with, with Emory. Pollard ranks up there with, with the top uh, Emory graduates, uh, just a superb human being. I spoke at his funeral, and I remember I, I, I thought, Pollard is everyone's best friend. Everybody who knows him thinks that Pollard is his best friend. That's a, he, 
he was, Bert always said, he's, he is the best gentleman I've ever met. Mm -hmm. Extraordinarily fortunate in uh, being able to become friends with Mr. Woodruff. We spent a lot of time together, and the more time I spent with him, the higher my opinion of him as a human being was. He, uh, he had the most ineffable smile I've ever seen on a man. He didn't always smile, but when he did, it was absolutely winsome. And I could see why, as a younger man, he was so successful uh, in whatever he did, because he just had this marvelous, in a sense, charisma in that mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. Not rhetorically, but personality-wise. And uh, I remember once uh, on his birthday was in December the 6th, I think, and the first year I was president, I was racking my brain to think, what can I give Mr. Woodruff? for a birthday present. And Alistair Cook had come to the campus uh, in October to deliver the Robert Jones Lecture, uh, the Bobby Jones Lecture. And when he, the next week, when he gave his weekly Voice from America, he uh, spent the whole time talking about Emory. And he raved about Emory, and he said it was the most beautiful campus he had been on in America. And he said, far better than Berkeley or Princeton or whatever. And so I, through um, <clears throat> some friends, I got hold of that tape and uh, took it down to Itchaway, where Mr. Woodruff always celebrated his birthday down at his plantation. I was, it was absolutely unheard of to say that you wanted to come on Mr. Woodruff's birthday and invite yourself. But I did. And they said, you can come at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> no stay for dinner. Okay. So I took a tape recorder and played it for him, the Alistair Cook thing, where he was so high on it. And um, I left. And from then on, I got an invitation on my own to come for the birthday every year <laughs> down there to Itchaway. And uh, uh, we had a good time. Um, you know, hunting was included in that, but uh, it was we shared a lot. And uh, you know, I looked upon him in a way as a kind of a father figure. He was a, a lovely human being, and uh, he was always interested in what we were doing in Emory. He wanted me to tell him all we were doing. I don't mean the minutia, but the big things. And he, he was so proud of it. And after, this is an important, good story. After we, the uh, Woodruff gift had been announced, it was on the front page of the New York Times and all, he, uh, he said, uh, uh, Doctor, he never called me Jim. Dr. Laney, do you, uh, do you know how much money Buck Duke gave to Trinity College, and I said, I've heard it was $40 million, Mr. Woodruff. He said, no. and how did they uh, show their appreciation? <laughs> I said, you know, they changed the name of Trinity College to Duke University. He took his cigar out of his mouth. <laughs> and uh, I said, I think that was appropriate, don't you, Mr. Woodruff? Yeah, I do. And I said, uh, and you know what? Your gift is the largest, it even beat that gift. He smiled and he said, yeah. And that was the end of the conversation. <laughs> I, was, I was so afraid he was going to ask me directly, but he never did. He, he had the best innate taste. The reason Coke became so universally known and, and, you, and I, I don't want to say loved, but accepted, is because the association with it were always of impeccable taste. He had, it was just natural to him. And he also had impeccable manners. And so he would go up to the edge, but he would never cross over. And he never seemed to bother him at all that we didn't change the name of the university.
Let me uh, <laughs> maybe close uh, by asking you a, a question that's more psychological than anything, perhaps, uh, I, without getting into the specifics of all that has uh, happened at Emory in the uh, 12 years, mm -hmm. nearly 12 years since <clears throat> you uh, left to become the ambassador to South Korea. Uh, you must, uh, it seems to me, think from time to time about your legacy and what you were able to do uh, with your colleagues uh, at Emory. Uh, and how, how does one, just to take it out of the personal realm, how does one uh, reflect on uh, that legacy uh, a decade after the fact? And, and how does one uh, hope for the future and, and mm -hmm. what comes after? How do you... How do you reflect on what you were able to do and, and what you uh, hope still can be done as a result of that? Well, first of all, I don't have any concerns institutionally about Emory. Um, Emory is flourishing beyond, far beyond anything I could have imagined when I was here. Uh, I, my confidence in what we were trying to do in terms of the spirit of Emory and the educational philosophy is so fundamental. That is, I, my confidence that it is so necessary and right and timely. And I'm pleased that Emory is carrying that on. And I, I believe that this is very important for higher education, not just for Emory. Mm -hmm. So when I think about uh, legacy, or whatever you want to call it, institutionally, I, I don't really, it's not something I think about much because I have such pride in where Emory is and no worries about it. It will, in fact, become, it continue to be a great institution. And my real commitment and concern, and this is sort of grows out of who I am, is really the issue of the nature of education. And I long for that to be, that tension I spoke about earlier, to be maintained here and and be uh, fruitful, that it be a fruitful tension, mutually fruitful. Uh, and I'm convinced that it, it will be uh, because there are enough trustees and the administration cares about these things. You care about these things. And that that's, you know, something I don't really worry about. I'm, I have a concern in only in the sense in which I wish it were more broadly mm -hmm. acknowledged and, and pursued. Uh, so in a way, my, I, I don't want to call it a legacy, my interest is in how that, the spirit of education really informs this nation. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess my sp time in Korea and in government has given me a sense of the nation. I, I don't want to sound grandiose at all, but I, I really, those are my greatest concerns. What? Who are we as a people and what are we doing and how does education fit into that? Mm -hmm. And just to be the mostest and the bestest is, is really, it's shallow. It's very shallow. And uh, I think education has as its primary purpose the deepening of these things. You know, the, the fundamental questions about life and what we're, what we're about and what we're, why we're doing things. And to raise these not in the sense of trying to depreciate all the various activities of humankind, but rather to make sure that there's certain focal points. Uh, that, that, that's what I'm concerned about and that's what I continue to speak about and work for. Mm -hmm. And I'm proud of Emory's role in that. Well, thank you. And thanks for your uh, legacy. Thanks for your time this morning. Well, it's been a pleasure. I mean, as you can tell, I enjoyed it. <laughs>